Hi, um, you know, this is Stephanie Trong with The Patient Story, and I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce um, our next story uh, coming up. Cheryl here is, I mean, we've just talked for a little bit, Cheryl, but I've read your story, um, and I'm so glad to have you to talk about mantle cell lymphoma. So great to have you with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I uh, appreciate everything that you're doing. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. And we couldn't do it truly without people like you. And, and so first, I just want to check in. How are you doing now? Well, I'm doing pretty great, actually. Um, I've been in remission for mantle cell lymphoma since uh, May 28th of 2015. Um, and I just had some basic blood work done uh, a few weeks ago. And it's perfect. It's literally down the line. It's perfect which to me is like a, a, an award <laughs> or a diploma. <laughs> it's an achievement um, to see something like that because when I was diagnosed, uh, it was a mess. Right. It was a mess. Right. So today I'm really in some of the best health of my life at 57 years old. That's amazing. You look yeah. great, you sound great. Um, I, you know, we can't get a much better response than it's perfect, you know, so yes. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear about the latest updates that you've got, you know, that you had your most recent check, everything's great. And without further ado, I'd love to dive into the story, actually. Sure. Now, um, you know, Cheryl, you sent me your timeline. I know that you were feeling, you know, usually we ask, what were your first symptoms? And for a lot of people, it's, you know, in a matter of months, you know, they go from their first symptoms to finally getting to a doctor, some kind of doctor who tells them it's this. Your story is different, right? Your story, you're feeling symptoms from 2000 mm -hmm. um, for over a decade, you know, well over until you finally get treatment. 15 years. Um, 15 years. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, a decade and a half. And so, yeah. um, can you just mention, you know, some of the things I know in 2000 you were feeling? Uh, some of the first symptoms and then your white blood cell count did start to rise a couple of years after that. But if you could sum it up from 2000 sure. to 2015, what were those major signs? Okay. So um, one day I was outside walking through town and it was kind of a windy, cool, uh, wet day. And I get back into my car and I, all of a sudden my face got really red, itchy and hot. And it was really strange and scary to look at myself. So I drove myself home and it took about 10 minutes to kind of dissipate. And I thought, you know, that's not normal. There's something wrong here. So I call my primary care doctor's office and the person I, doctor I usually see wasn't there, but his, another person was in his practice. So uh, on Monday, this was Friday, on Monday I went to see him. And I told him about what happened and he said, oh, that's called cold urticaria. It's, you know, when your skin is cold and it warms up, you develop hives or a burning rash. And he goes, oh, I have that too, it's no big deal. Uh, if you want, you can take an over-the-counter antihistamine, but it's no big deal. So I'm like, okay. So it happened again and it happened again and it was actually really scary. Um, and you never know when it would happen. And it would be when your skin would get cold and then you would warm up somehow. Um, and then it was happening in the summer because you're outside, well, it's great, it's warm, right? But then you go inside and it's air conditioning. So it's like the change in temperature. So I wasn't satisfied with that response. So then I went to an allergist and she ran a whole bunch of tests on me and she said, it's idiopathic, which means you have it, but we don't know why you have it. So here's an EpiPen in case you get dunked into a, a cold pool of water <laughs> or you, you know, go into anaphylactic shock. And here's a, at the time, here's a prescription for Allegra. It was prescription only at that time. And so I took that and I thought, you know, that's just not right. There, there's something different about my biochemistry now that there wasn't before. Why is this happening? Just because they can't figure it out doesn't mean there's not something wrong or behind it. Right. So I lived with this for a while. And then I would go for my annual physical. And in 2004, my uh, white blood count started to climb higher towards the range. Uh, 
And then I started to become anemic. And so then it was, oh, did you have a cold recently? That'll drive up the number. Oh, you know, you're a woman, you're, you know, every month, you're, you know, you're, you're becoming anemic from that. Here, take some iron. And um, every year I would go back and it would be the same thing, but it would creep up a little bit more and a little bit more. And I become a little more anemic and a little more anemic. And it would be like the same thing. It would just, you know, go on and on. So then... It just, sorry, it amazes me how many times the female anatomy pops yes. up in explaining the way. Flames for everything. <laughs> for everything. And, and Cheryl, I know that, you know, there were a lot of different things and, um, you know, it wasn't until 2015. I, I do want to get to the part where you talk about your, it was retinal problems, right? Well, yeah, if I, uh, um, so I, um, Things started to really seem to take a turn in 2012. Mm -hmm. I went through something very stressful and um, I wasn't feeling well. And then I, I did something called a thermography and uh, my results came back very, very significant compared to the previous years when I had done the test. And so um, I chalked it up to the stress of what I was going through. But since 2012, I really started to feel um, just exhausted, exhausted from doing nothing um, and um, just, just not right. And then I thought, okay, you know, I'm going through, maybe I'm going through menopause. This is what it feels like, again, with the female issues. And, you know, just kind of chalking it up to, to that, you know, changes. And then I got a retinal hemorrhage in my eye. And that was early in 2015. And I don't mess with my eyes. So I went to um, my eye doctor who took a look at me and kind of had a look of horror on her face. And she sent me to that moment to a retinal specialist, like from there to the other office. And he looked at me and he said, um, when was your last physical? And I said, well, actually it's been a couple of years now. And he said, okay, I want to, you to diagnose for hypertension, um, diabetes, and a collagen vascular disorder. And I still, I still carry the prescription in my wallet to this day. And so I went right out, I got a full physical. When I went that day, the doctor, felt my abdomen. And he said, your abdomen's rock hard. Something's going on. So he said, I want to send you for an ultrasound of your, an abdominal ultrasound for tomorrow morning. We'll set it up. So, okay. The next day now, March 10th of 15, he calls. He says, I want you and your husband to come in here to my office. Uh, we canceled your ultrasound. So Jim, my husband and I went and um, he sits us down in the office and he shows me my blood work that came back stat. <laughs> the lab couldn't get it back fast enough to him. And he said, you have leukemia. And when he showed me my, my white blood count driven by my lymphocytes was 240,000. <laughs> the range is normally four to 11,000. So now it was 240,000. And then they did further analysis on it overnight. And there were all these crazy cells, cancer cells, misshapen cells, uh, immature cells. I mean, you name it. And I had it. Mm. So he said, I already called the emergency room. I want you to go there right now. Don't even stop. Don't go home go there right now, they're waiting for you. And his friend was head of the leukemia department there. Now on paper, I presented like I had leukemia, but then over time when I was in the hospital and they were doing all the diagnostic testing on me, the bone marrow biopsy came back that I had mantle cell lymphoma, right. which right. probably would have been better off with the leukemia. Right. So now they switched me to that the lymphoma floor. And, and um, new before, doc. before we go even further, because you've just covered a lot of ground there, and I, I just want to pause for it, which is great. You did yeah, a great yeah. job summing that up. You know, 15 years, you sum that up in minutes. 
<laughs> and, and and literally overnight, right? It was supposed to be this ultrasound, and then it's like cancel that, get into my office. Can you remember what it felt like uh, for you and your husband? I mean, when was it? Was it then when you got that call to go into the office that you knew something was more serious, or was it when you had scheduled the ultrasound? And then if you could walk us through from that point to when you actually heard those words, and I know it wasn't leukemia, but it was cancer. How do you, how you process that in that moment? So I, I actually thought something was really wrong for a while and it, and it, it just made sense. It's like, okay, now I know what I have. And I, and I remember saying to other people, I think I have lupus or I think I have some, you know, or, and then I actually said to somebody, a close friend, I said, you know, I think I have lymphoma. And I just came out with that. And I, I just said it. But at first I, I was saying, gosh, I think I have, you know, so I thought I had some autoimmune issue. And then the, the eye thing happens, the retinal hemorrhage. And then, you know, when he said, your eyes are fine, but, you know, except for the hemorrhage, but when was your last physical? I, that, it was then that I knew, you know, I'm in, I'm in for something. Um, and so uh, when the doctor examined me and he mentioned my rock hard abdomen, I thought ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, you know, I thought of a cancer in that area. Mm. Now, what it really was, was that my spleen was enlarged to three times its size from all, from catching all of the, you know, 240,000, you know, times mil millions of white blood cells. It was like the repository for everything. Right. Um, right. But basically I had cancer cells throughout my entire body and yeah. in my eye. It's and what, you know, blocked my, my little capillary, right. I guess. I mean, it's so amazing much. to me. You, you you knew something was wrong. You know, mm. you could feel it. So so then maybe it was two things here. But so for you, does it? I mean, I know relief isn't necessarily associated with a diagnosis, but the fact that you had an answer, it feels like, or it seems like it was like, okay, now I can. Yeah, it makes this. sense. This all makes sense. And you know, and then I didn't I didn't get the connection with some of my symptoms previously. Uh, until I was in the hospital and I was thinking about it because, you know, you, you have a lot of time to just lay there and think. Um, and then I kind of put it all together. And I, of course, since I've been treated for the lymphoma, I haven't had the cold urticaria. Um, I was just outside before. It's a wet, cold, blustery day. Nothing. So, you know, clearly, and now I understand the mechanisms behind, you know, why that happens. Um, but, uh, it, it all, you know, pieced all of this together, but I just go back to saying back in, in 2000, something is wrong that wasn't wrong before, because this is happening now that didn't happen then. What is it? Mm -hmm. And nobody, I, I won't say nobody cared because they, of course they cared, but nobody thought deeply about it that I, as I did. I thought deeply about it, but no professionals really thought deeply right. about it. Right. No, you're bringing up a great point that comes up in almost every single interview I do, which is about self-advocacy, only because, of course, mm -hmm. there are medical professionals, but the only pr constant who's thinking about you is you, and, and it's this very sort of tough balance sometimes. So I'd love to talk about that more. Um, in a little bit, but I, I had stopped you because I wanted to pause. I do want to kind of continue on now, though. I mean, you you're rushed over. You go so you go straight to the ER. Um, I, I do want to ask you about some of these diagnostic tests too. Mm -hmm. So, as you talk about each diagnostic test that you underwent, could you describe what it was like in human terms for people who've never undergone them before, whether it was scans or a bone marrow biopsy? Um. You, honestly, you start to feel like a thing. You start to feel like a um, project. You lose your humanity a little bit, I have to say, going through it. And you, you're now, you're a thing to be figured out, a project. Um, and so I had heard horror stories about the bone marrow biopsy. 
And the first time I had it done uh, in the hospital to diagnose me, the actual, the doctor, the friend of my primary care doctor, head of leukemia, he did it. And it was like nothing. I'm like, wow, you know, but this isn't so bad. Okay. Um, it was, it was pretty good. Um, and then, you know, going for the scan. So I'm somebody that likes to avoid radiation whenever possible. And now I'm like, okay, you know, my whole body's being a just, you know, let them do it that we have to figure this out. It's, you know, again, you're playing mind games. Um, I had to have a colonoscopy and an endoscopy to see if there were any, uh, lymphoma cells, uh, there. And, um, that was scary because now that's under anesthesia and the prep was miserable and now you're in the hospital doing the prep and it's already miserable in the hospital but you know i did it i had a great doctor and um and then they found a few little what they call nests little groupings of cells in my stomach my colon was great and it's like well great now i don't have to get another colonoscopy for a while they just did it so awesome well done um but you know I was getting blood work done like every few hours, right. it seemed. I was a pin cushion and um, poking and prodding me. And uh, it's amazing how different each um, uh, person's technique was. <laughs> you know, some you'd hardly feel it and some I, I, would, I would literally scream in pain. Um, but I was okay with all of this because again, it was gonna help them help me and get to the bottom of really what's going on. So I just, I don't know, it's like otherworldly. You, you go into a place in your mind that I never thought I could go. Right. Um, but somehow you just, you just do it. You, you're in a crisis situation. You just, something switches on. And you're like, okay, I got to do this. I got to get through this. And then I got to get through this and the next thing and the next thing. And then it's all for good. It's going to help everyone help me. And, and you just, that's it. You just got to do it. And there's a plan and it's just moving towards that goal line. And, and I hear you on that. And it resonates with me personally as well. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the individual, um, you know, sort of tests, but people do wonder about them. So I know for you, the bone marrow biopsy, for instance, was okay, which that's wonderful. Well, the second one I had wasn't so okay, okay. but I'm glad it wasn't the first one. <laughs> so so I didn't worry about it. It is true what you're saying too. It depends sometimes on the people who are administering, say, the bone marrow biopsy. But in terms of the actual procedure, um, can you sort of walk through someone who's never gone through one, what they do, whatever you remember from it? Well, um, okay, so, um, you know, you're on your stomach and they numb that, uh, the lower part of your back um, with a local anesthetic. And then um, they, they like essentially drill into your spine. They literally drill and you can feel the vibration of it. Um, and they go into a few different places to get some different samples. And, and then that's it. But I really, I felt more like the, the grinding of the apparatus than um, pain. Um, the pain is when they give you the, the, the shot of the anesthetic, but even that wasn't bad. And, you know, he was a doctor, and, but he was so gentle with me. It was um, really uh, nothing at all uh, that time. Um, and as a result of having that done, and it probably took him like seven minutes, mm -hmm. like not quite 10 minutes right. to do the whole thing and get the samples. Um, but as a result of doing the biopsy, we realized that I didn't have leukemia. I had mantle cell lymphoma, right. so, which is a much more serious uh, diagnosis. Right. Um, right. So, uh, you know, it gave, it gave good information. Right. A very necessary part of the whole process. Um, thank you for that. And, and, and do you remember how long it took for pathology to get back with that? Because it's not immediate, right? Or was it for you? Um, it was, it was, um, cause that was that evening. So I was admitted that day, March 10th, and it was that evening that I had it done. So it came back the next day, came okay. back the next day, you know, it's at, at the hospital, right. you know, the expedite things. And, right. Um, right. Right. And then they're like, okay, now we have to transfer you to lymphoma, the lymphoma floor with different people. Right. Um, 
Actually, okay. in, in that <laughs> moment, I mean, had you, I mean, it's such a rare cancer. You had heard of lymphoma, but mantle cell in particular, you didn't know about, right? Um, never heard of it. Never, <laughs> never heard of it. Wish I could never hear of it again. <laughs> uh, yeah. And hopefully, <laughs> really, no you know, yes. Um, you know, just <laughs> curious about that experience of when they told you it was mantle cell lymphoma. Did they explain in that moment? Did they sort of characterize what that meant for you? You know, no, um, not exactly. Um, they just more defined the treatment. Now, what I'll say is I happen to have a very good friend who was a retired physician. Um, and so he was kind of like my advocate and my sounding board. So he was able to kind of deconstruct some things for, for me. Um, and kind of let me know a little bit more, but not too much more, because I didn't want to know too much more. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I, I feel like that helped, that helped me get through things, was having that, um, just what I need to know at the time kind of thing. But I know someone else is looking out for my best interest as well. Right. And um, I, I, I knew, I knew it was more serious. And I knew that what they had told me, because then I, I asked them, and by the way, I didn't, I, I didn't include this in my last answer when I sat with my doctor, when he told me the news and what I was thinking. The first thing I, look, I looked him right in the face and I said, am I gonna die? And he said, no, you're not gonna die, but you need attention now. You need to get this dealt with now. And that's when he said, don't go home. Go right there. Don't right. make a stop. Right. So once again, I asked the doctors, am I going to die from this? And uh, one of the doctors, she said, um, no, you're not going to die. We're not going to let you die. But you're going to have to go through six rounds of inpatient chemotherapy on alternate A and B cycles. And then when you're done, we're going to do a bone marrow transplant on you. And then that's how you're going to be. That's how you're going to be okay. And of course, you know, they don't use the word cure. Right. No, but, you know, never. <laughs> you know, and I understand that. But, right, right. Um, you know, that's how I wasn't going to die, basically, yes. was her answer. Yeah. And to get to the treatment right away. And I know you did. It was a matter of a couple of days after that. Well, yeah, and I was in the hospital already. <laughs> right. And I do want to talk about that soon. I do also want to, before we get any further, um, just the way you had done with the bone marrow biopsy, if you could walk us through the endoscopy, colonoscopy, and yeah. your favorite, the CT scan. Ah, oh, the CT scan. Okay. So the um, colonoscopy and endoscopy, um, you know, was done by a doctor in the hospital um, who then became my subsequent GI doctor. And so we had to do the, the fabulous prep that everybody talks about. And so, you know, I had to drink this uh, really hideous tasting stuff and then basically clean myself out um, the night before. And then of course you're kind of up all night anyway. So the good thing about that is you're tired by the next morning, you're kind of out of it cause you're so tired. Um, so, um, they wheeled you down to the, um, procedure area. It wasn't an operating room. It was like where they do these cause they do a lot of these. And, um, and then, you know, I talked to the doctor for a few minutes. I got a good feeling about him. And then, um, you know, they put me in this, you know, twilight sleep. And um, I was, I was glad, I'm like, was glad to get them both done. And again, I thought, you know, um, I don't have to, if everything's okay, then I don't have to get another colonoscopy for 10 years. So, you know, I was, I was fearing it. Uh, I was 51, just turning 52 at the time. It's like, yep, I should be going for that anyway. Great, I got it over with. So then when I woke up, you know, and they told me my results were good. I felt good and um, relieved. And uh, immediately I felt good, you know, like, okay, you know, that's over with, you know, you're out of the anesthesia. It's like, great, you know, what, what can I have to eat? 
<laughs> yeah, that's a very important question and all of mine. I remember when I was waiting for my uh, surgery just for them to take out a lymph node to test yeah. and it was delayed and delayed, but I had to fast the entire time. Mm. Only thing on my mind other than I just want the surgery over is when can I eat again? Yeah. <laughs> so that's universal. Yeah. Um, Which is a good sign, by the way. Right, right, right. It's a good sign. And, and then I know, Cheryl, you don't like radiation at all, but you had to undergo the I CT had to scan. undergo the CT scan. So um, I, they, they wheel you down, and then they, um, they give you this injection, which, and then they tell you, you know, we want to see some people react badly to this, so we want to, you know, make sure you're okay. And so that's comforting. So, yeah, it's terrifying. And then, you know, you go into this machine, which you know, could be a little claustrophobic, but my head was out, so that's okay. And then you hear these, you know, click, click sounds. And um, you just, you, you feel, you could, you like in your head, you feel the radiation from it. You like, you just know what they're doing and you're like, just get this over with. But the thing I kept hoping was like, I wouldn't have a reaction to the, the, the injection that they gave me. The contrast. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was almost occupying my mind. Was that fact of you know am I having a reaction? Am I having a reaction? No, I'm not. Okay, that's good. No, am I having one? No, I'm okay. And so um, that kept me occupied. And um, and so the, those were really the tests that they used to diagnose me: the CT scan, the endoscopy, the colonoscopy, the bone marrow biopsy, and a million different blood tests. Now, one of the things about the blood tests is that it was important for them to see whether or not this was genetic or acquired. Uh, it was not genetic, because if it was genetic, then they would have to treat you differently than if it was something that you acquired. And so this was something that at some point in my life, there was damage to the DNA in some of my cells and they just replicated out of control over time. Right. And so um, that was important information that they needed to get. Right, before they figure out which way to go in terms right. of treatment. Um, so that means then you did with the blood test, there was genetic testing that had happened mm -hmm. to make sure you didn't have those mutations. Have any, mutations. you know, yeah. I mean, I had, I had gene mutations, mm -hmm. but they were only in the cells that were cancerous. I see. Okay, Meaning, right, right. I, yes. Right, right. That makes sense. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's really important information. So there is a divergence in terms of treatment regimens when that's figured out. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and let's, I mean, I know this is the most favorite part for everyone, got, getting the chemotherapy, the treatment. Oh um, you, you were already in the hospital for a few mm -hmm. days or a couple days. Um, so you, you did already outline what they said would be the chemo. Can you talk a little bit more? So you said it was every three weeks, it'd be six cycles, A and B. Can you talk about the, do you remember the different drugs and um, if you could just describe, especially that first chemo cycle. Oh my gosh. So um, the, first, the first thing um, in the hospital was the, um, it's called the uh, rituxan. It's a biologic. So that was the first drug that I got. So technically it wasn't chemotherapy. Now they do that the day before, and then you get the chemotherapy. So it was March 14th of 15 that I got that and I happened to be alone. Everybody had gone home at that point, it was like late afternoon. Um, and so they started to give me the infusion of the rituxan. Well, what happened very quickly was that I started to get chills. I was shaking uncontrollably and I felt like I had a fever. I was, I was just getting a fever. Um, after about 10, 15 minutes of getting the rituxan infusion. So I called them, help, you know, like this isn't right, there's something wrong. They stopped it. They said, okay, you're having a reaction. Sometimes people have a reaction. Well, what that reaction really was is that I was so loaded with cancer cells throughout my body. This was literally the cancer cells being killed off. And that was what I was feeling. But because I had so much cancer in me to be killed, the reaction was just way too much. So they had to scale it back. 
and give it to me over a lot, a lot less, over a lot longer period of time. And then that became what we ended up doing over all six cycles, even though by like cycle three or four, I probably didn't need it. But I, want, I was like, I'll stay here longer and you give it to me slower. Right. So I thought to myself, geez, man, if this is how this is starting out, this isn't good. I mean, it was really one of the, there were several low points. That was definitely one of them. And um, so I got through it. And then the next day we started the chemo and there were four different drugs for cycle A. And so it's A, B, A, B, A, B. Um, a is better than B. B is two drugs plus rituxan. A is four drugs plus rituxan, but it was better. And I think vancomycin, adriamycin, a lot of sins. <laughs> a lot of sins, um, I like that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sins. Um, and so what happens is, you know, you have to be impatient because you're getting it over many hours uh, infused into you and they have to constantly keep checking your blood counts because the chemo will make certain blood cells plummet and will also affect um, uh, liver function, for example, or kidney function. So they have to constantly test you over the times to make sure that things are okay. And if they're not okay, then they have to give you treatment for the things that are not okay. Right. right. And, so, and before you, you describe that, Cheryl, the, it was, all, was it always Rituxan that preceded the chemo? Always Rituxan. Okay. The six times we, I always got that. Now, after this first hospital stay, then how it would be is I would go into the cancer center and I would get the infusion in the outpatient room. Got it. Uh, with a bunch of other people getting whatever it is they were getting. And then I would go home. Okay. So on those days, it would be, I'd be there six hours, eight hours, getting that slow rituxan infusion. But then I would get to go home and then prepare for the next day, being admitted to the hospital for the next, you know, four or five days to get that, the other infusions. That was my next question. So it would be one day of rituxan, six, seven, eight hours of infusion, slow drip. And then yes. the cycle A and cycle B, were they both over four days, five yeah. days? About four days um slowly and um periodically you know so i'd get one and then we'd stop for a while and then maybe i'd get another one and then the weirdest one was on cycle a i think it was the vancomycin it was like a really like orange colored one and they'd inject that into you like just a couple of hours before you were scheduled to leave the hospital so you weren't you know you like and then they rushed you out. It was kind of weird how that worked, but good, you know, get me out of here. Right. I have to tell you, there's no, there, there's no feeling like being released from the hospital. Like you feel like you're in custody and you're hooked up to those IVs for days. You, they go everywhere with you. And it's like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. Okay, I got to take, you know, this with me. I think I gave it a name at some point. And it's got to go, you know, you're walking around the hallway, you got to get that exercise, get right. out of bed, and you're dragging it along with you, and you're hooked up to this thing. The freedom of getting that off of you and, and just being out in the fresh air was fabulous. It's the best thing ever in the world. The, the little thing. Like you were released from prison. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's how that must feel, I guess. Yeah, I mean, and, and you're right. And the little things that we take for granted, these little freedoms. And of course, what you're referring to is you sure. have that sort of, yeah, <laughs> you'd have that ivy pole um, mm -hmm. and be hooked up to it. And that's right. You have to go to the bathroom. You got to take the whole thing with you um, no matter where you go. Actually, on that note, uh, two things come to mind. First, I had forgotten to ask you, did you get a port, a pick line, or did you go IV? Okay. So um, the first three times or so, we just did IV. And then the fourth time, we decided to go with a pick line because it was just getting too much and, and you know, the jabbing me and now the veins are collapsing and that, you know. So I ended up getting a pick line installed and using that for the subsequent visits. Can you describe that uh, to people, the experience of the pick line and any sort of tips? I know that's another thing because it's dangling here. Was it in your arm? 
yeah, it was in my, it was in this, this arm and I have a teeny tiny little scar from it. But, um, yeah, so, um, I, uh, they wheel you down and they, um, they, they do some scan and I'm trying to remember what kind of even scan, you know, uh, is it x-ray scans or something of the moment, uh, you know, to kind of see, you know, what's going on and then to guide them to put the thing in your, in your arm. And one of the things that you have to be careful about is infection. So they really, really, really worry about this thing getting infected. And so it's got to be flushed out. Now, the thing is, you, you take that home with you. You go home with it in your arm, and so now you have to learn how to flush that out yourself. And for the first, you know, bunch of times, we had somebody, a nurse, come to the house with all the equipment and, you know, show you how to do it, but then you have to do it because the last thing that can happen is that get infected or it's a tragedy. Right, right. Um, and so now you've got this thing in your arm. You've got, you can't get it wet, you know, so you got to prep it when you when you take a shower you gotta um put right. saran wrap around it and uh you know and then it's there it's just a, another reminder of of things but uh, honestly it made life a lot easier when they had to give me all of the um infusions the infusions and um uh take blood blood exactly right right you don't have to yeah. get poked every single time I have to get poked. and hope yeah. the best um, thank you for explaining that, Cheryl. I'm glad that you were able to get the pick line and relieve yeah, the veins yeah. a little bit. So um, side effects, you know, people mm, yes. have to deal with. Do you remember, they must have been, you said cycle A was better than B. So um, let's talk about cycle A first. What were the side effects that you were dealing with and when did they start to hit you? Okay, so, you know, the obvious first side effect is that your hair starts to fall out. So um, it started about a week after I got home and clumps of hair would just be on the wall of the shower. And I mean, that's just, that's just a freaky thing to see. And um, my hair was even a lot bigger and longer then. And, um, you know, to see that it's like a part of my body is now on the shower wall. My, my body's coming apart, I think is kind of how I felt. And um, then, you know, my, my fr friend of mine is a hairdresser. So I went to her and I just, I don't know why I didn't do, I should have done this. Um, I had her shave me. And um, uh, it was a lot less traumatic. And then actually her sister is a, is a wig maker. Um, so she, at the same time, she then took all my measurements and made me a custom wig of human hair similar to, you know, what I had. Um, honestly, I wore the wig about three times because it was spring going into summer. It was hot. Where am I going? I'm going, no, I'm going to doctor's offices. I'm going to the hospital. Where am I going that I care? So I still have this, you know, beautiful wig custom made for me. Hopefully I never need it again. Um, maybe someone else will not want it and I can give it to them. But, um, that was, um, that was hard. That was hard, but you know, honestly, I after the initial shock of it coming off of me, I, I got over it and, and everybody told me what a great shaped head I had. And I actually did, um, you know, and it's like, I really don't look bad without hair. Like, okay. Um, so that was, you know, an obvious side effect. Um, probably uh, cycle B, uh, one of the side effects was the, these horrible rashes. So I had these scabby rashes all over my legs that were just absolutely hideous. I mean, just, just horrible. And uh, cycle B, my blood counts really, my platelets plummeted. Um, so the littlest thing that would make me bleed would be a horror show. Um, and there were a couple of times where I had to go to the the cancer center and get infusions uh, because my, my, I was bleeding and I, I, my blood counts were too low. Um, but then when I was getting treated and they analyzed me, I also had to get infusions. So between platelets and blood, I probably got, you know, 50 units between. Um, 
but that was the probably the worst side effect because that's scary. I mean, you're, you, you, the little is cut and now you're uncontrollably bleeding and you can't stop it. That's, that's horrific. Right. So that was probably the worst side effect. No, wait, there was one other one. Of course. <laughs> wait, there's more. Um, so in the um, beginning of June, um, I went back to uh, get a checkup and I had a fever. I wasn't feeling right. So I knew something wasn't right. And it turns out I had a high fever. I had like 103. So they admitted me to the hospital thinking I had some crazy infection. And so I said to them, I don't feel like I have an infection. I feel like it's something else. But they ran every test on me. Now at this point, then they ran a bronchoscopy, which is, you know, you're put out for this and then they put a scope and they look at your lungs. My lungs were great. Um, I didn't have any blood work that indicated an infection. They did another CT scan, yay, to see if I had anything. Um, they couldn't find anything. They had, they called in infectious disease specialists and I kept having these fevers. I would have 103, 104, and then I would take Tylenol and get them back down and another six hours, I'd start to get the chills again and the fevers would go up. This went on for 11 days. I was in the hospital, not having chemo, but having these fevers that they couldn't figure out. At the end, they admitted it's an effect of the chemo. I said, okay, I told you that. <laughs> but, you know, they have to do their due diligence and figure it out. Right. But I knew I didn't have an infection. But because of this, I was on all kinds of IV antibiotics, just in case, just in case. So, you know, those do other things to you, right. um, which then you have to correct. So um, that was another really, really bad side effect. So, so to be clear, in that moment, they said, oh, this is actually a known side effect of this particular yes. case management. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've outlined some pretty horrific ones. Um, did you also suffer from either cycle A and or B, the usual nausea and fatigue? Oh, and that. <laughs> of course. Uh, yes, <laughs> I did. Um, you know, the nausea, well, okay. Probably, how can I even forget this? The mouth sores. And the mouth sores were much worse with cycle um, B than A. But I would be having the chemo and then I would start to be nauseous in the hospital. So then I would go home and then the mouth sores would start. And they gave you some prophylactic rinses for it, but you know, it still happens. And so now what was happening is the nausea was subsiding but I couldn't eat because the mouth sores hurt so much. Now I'm starving and I wanna eat, but now I can't swallow because it hurts too much. So I lost a lot of weight. Um, and then by the third week of the cycle, the mouth sores would dissipate, I'd feel stronger. And that's when I would just load up with food. I would load up as much as I could eat then to prepare for the next time. Right, right. And when I mean load up, load up with good, positive, healthy food, not junk food, right. but good, healthy food um, to build my body up as right, strong as right. it could be for the next series. Right, right. It's always that, especially that week three, that good week where you get to yeah. do all that uh, good work. Um, so do you have overall any guidance for people on what did help you with some of these side effects, any medication or non-medication that worked for you? Um, well, the, uh, for the mouth sores, you know, they give you this, uh, it's kind of a salt wash um, kind of thing. And so, you know, that does help. But I was drinking a lot of cooling uh, things with ice, um, and that and that helped. Um, other than that, there wasn't a lot you could you could do for that. Um, the rashes, they gave me some cream to put on. Uh, you know, I did that. Um, it helped, I guess. Um, I, I don't have any scars from from the experience, so that's good. Um, in terms of the nausea, 
you know, like I said, it, it, it went away, you know, by the time I got home, it kind of went away. Uh, uh, I threw up only one time and that was in the hospital on this, after this, in the sixth, during the sixth round, mm -hmm. they'd given me some Tylenol, some pre-meds and that came up. But that's the only time I actually threw up, shockingly that's enough. That's really good. Yeah, uh, I'm surprised. And I know that you had said um, in May, on May 28th, there was already the no evidence of, of disease. So yeah. I'm, I'm assuming, so was that sort of your mid-treatment PET CT scan at that time? Well, well, that was my second bone marrow biopsy. And that is literally the only time I had an anxiety attack was during that and i um i i'm allergic to certain anesthetics local anesthetics and i think i had a reaction to the local anesthetic which then just set me into complete anxiety attack and so we had to calm me down and deal with that and then i felt the whole thing i felt the whole thing it was the complete opposite experience of the first time and had the first time been the second experience, oh, I would have been terrified. But I went into it like, oh, it's going to be no big deal, whatever. And then it was, it was hard. It was the only time I actually had an anxiety attack, which is shocking for me because I would have thought I would ha have had a million of them over the experience. But like I said, you just go into a place in your head. It's like you're out of your, your body. And, and you're just like, I got to do this. I got to get through this. I got to do this. I got to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I just went with it all. Um, so the bone marrow biopsy mm -hmm. was one thing that helped diagnose my remission. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is the PCR test, which tests for minimal residual disease. And so they've been, it's just a blood test. It's a, it's a, 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 a not a complicated blood test, but it's not a run of the mill, you know, get the results back quickly kind of test. It takes a while. Right. And that came back at that time, it came back as no evidence of disease. That's amazing. And so, be and the biopsy came back, but we didn't get these results until after my fourth treatment. So the good news was, the bone marrow, uh, the um, transplant that they, the bone marrow transplant that they were planning for me, literally interviewing donors, you know, trying to find donors. Uh, now, I, I, I looked at them when I got this result, and I said, well, I guess we don't have to do that anymore, do we? And they said, they looked, and they're like, no, I guess we don't. But if it comes back, you're getting that stem cell transplant. And I'm like, it's not coming back. Because reading about what that entailed, right, brutal, right, right. So Difficult. it must have been a relief for you. You'd already, you were still in the middle of chemo. You'd have to finish this out, but you didn't have to do that last thing. So that must have been like, okay, I can yeah. take some good news. But you know, it was it was crazy because you know, just like two and a half months earlier, I'm I'm just loaded with my whole body is just loaded with these cancerous white blood cells from top to bottom, stage four. And two and a half months later, there's no evidence of any disease in me. How is that possible? It was miraculous. It really was. It, they don't see it often. They really don't. And I feel like I was spared for a reason. And I think being able to tell my story and give encouragement to people, mm -hmm. I think is, is part of that. I think I that's a reason. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm kind of getting a little emotional because I feel like something helped us connect. I'm so happy we get to get your story out there because it's a hopeful one, but it's also very straightforward. You're being honest about the entire experience and it's so human, right? Like everything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, I, I want to thank you, Cheryl, for that. Um, we we, I mean, would love to keep talking. I, if you don't mind, I'd love to ask some, some more questions about No, I, I mean, I have so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> we want to hear whatever, it. whatever you would like, I'd love to. Hear. Yeah, I, I do have one more before we go into a, a very important, um, you know, section talking about mental health and wellness mm -hmm. and all these, all these different topics. But, you know, you'd been in the hospital so many times. I mean, six times alternating these different cycles of chemotherapy do you have any guidance for people 
um, or actually you were there for more than six times, but if, right. if, you, yeah. Yeah. if you could actually sort of, you know, so you were talking about, for instance, the IV pool when you were connected, you know, these are things that people don't really think about that they'll have to deal with. Did you figure anything else out uh, while you were in the hospital that helped you get through these hospital yes. stuff? You know, it's not easy. Yes. If you can have somebody bring in your food, have them bring in your food and have them bring in good, healthy food. Um, some of the hospital food was okay, but not the most health promoting uh, uh, nutrition. <laughs> it's, it gets something into you if you can, if you can eat it. But um, I had you know, my husband and a family friend um, brought in uh, like homemade uh, soups and they brought in uh, green juices and things, but they made them take them out because they were raw. Mm -hmm. And they thought that it could be a disease risk with the raw juices. Honestly, when I was home, I did juices, I did smoothies. Sometimes the, the cold smoothies were all I could get down and I would pack my, um, my supplements into that and anything nutritious I can get in there and get down through the mouth sores. And it was very cold. But if they could, you know, if you can have people bring in good, you know, positive, healthy food, that's definitely some advice. Um, the problem is the hospital is like the worst place to get any rest. And especially with what I had, they're testing your blood every few hours. So two o'clock in the morning, the lights go on, they come, the phlebotomist comes in, they're doing, you know, great. So I'm getting like an hour or two of sleep at a time. Um, I don't even know what to say about that because it is, it is what it is, but just know that that's going to be a thing. Uh, the other thing is if you could get up and move around, but safely, you know, if you're, if you feel like you're going to fall, don't do it. But to get out of that bed and get a little bit of activity, they would have like a lap counter and you'd make laps around the floor and, you know, see who did what, almost like a contest. And, you know, and they were encouraging that. But, you know, you shouldn't do that by yourself, too. You should have somebody there. So me and my little IV pole and husband or friend, you know, would go and, you know, do the laps. But it was important to try to move around as much as you could. But understand your limitations. And if you feel like you're going to fall, the last thing you want to do is fall. Trust me, it's a tragedy. Don't fall. Even getting up and going to the bathroom. If you feel the least bit unsteady or dizzy, have somebody help you. Right. That's great. I love all those little you know, tips and pieces of guidance because you've been through it. Um, and yeah, the hospital, definitely not a great place to get sleep, unfortunately. Um, yeah. so, so, so as we wrap up this part about treatment, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you were given this great news, no evidence of disease. You had to finish out the six cycles. You got your last one in the first week of August. What's mm -hmm. the follow-up been like uh, since then? Have you had to get more scans done, um, bone marrow biopsies, or is it this PCR test? How is it being monitored? Okay, so I went for a PET scan that September just to make sure that there was nothing there. There was nothing there. And I went for a follow-up endoscopy because at the time they had found those little nests of some uh, lymphoma cells. And so, you know, they want to check it out. There was nothing there. So clean, beautiful. Um, at first, the first year, my follow-up was every three months. And so what that would consist of is going to the lab first uh, in the cancer center and having, you know, a CBC. And then they, you know, just test some of your vitals. And then you go upstairs and then you see the doctor. And they, you go over the results and that's it. So then... Um, after that, now, because I was doing so well, it's every six months. And, but because I, I won't go for any more scans if I don't have to go for a scan. If I don't need radiation, I don't want to have any more radiation. So because of what I had can be detected very specifically through blood, I'm lucky. I can do these PCR tests. So now, a month before my visit, 
I go to the lab, they draw the blood for the PCR test, they send it to a lab out west, it takes about a month to get the results back, and then I see the oncologist, and then that day when I go, I still get the CBC, I go upstairs, right. they have the results of the PCR test and the CBC. Wow. I have to tell you, those are the most nerve-wracking visits. And about a couple of weeks before I get really cranky and crabby, <laughs> And um, sometimes I'll go to my primary care doctor, have them just do a CBC, just so I can see, oh, okay, you're good. You know, no surprises. There's going to be no surprises. It makes me feel better. He's more than happy to do it. Um, that's the worst part of this thing is, are those visits, you know, because you're successful. But what if, I, you know, what if one day I'm not? And then what? What's, you know, and then that, that voice of, well, you're going for that, that, you know, stem cell transplant, <laughs> um, you know, comes through my head. It can't happen. Not a possibility. I don't even want to put that out there. Just right. it can't happen. Well, um, so th that is literally what my treatment is or my follow-ups. Right, right. uh, just every six months I, I see him. I, I love that you brought that up because it's actually a great segue, Cheryl, into talking about topics. And, um, you know, you've outlined some things people talk about in survivorship, which mm -hmm. is, you know, it's great, right? It's great to get to the other side. We're grateful for it. But just because the treatment has ended and maybe the great news of no evidence disease doesn't mean that suddenly, poof, this anxiety or fear is suddenly gone, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's a really good point. Um, do you, do you want to talk anything else about how it's been for you the last few years in terms of survivorship? Um, you know, I know you practice mindfulness and other things that help you yeah. day to day. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to share on that? Um, well, I feel like my best insurance policy against something going wrong is taking as good a care of myself and my, my body and my mind as I can. So, that's the part that I'm doing. You know, the doctors do their part, but you know, I have a part in this too. So if I take care of myself, and I have to take care of myself better than the average person now that I've gone through all of this. If I can do the right things, I'm ensuring myself against a recurrence and also a mitigating effects of that really, really, really harsh treatment that they give you in hazmat suits with skull and crossbones on it, they're putting into your veins. So I have to do really well in terms of nutrition. I eat a plant-based diet, um, a whole food plant-based diet. I limit processed foods. Um, I take a whole bunch of supplements that protect cells, protect the immune system. Um, I I uh, do the fasting mimicking diet every few months, which helps rejuvenate and get rid of cells that are dead damaged, don't belong in your body, um, and regrow stem cells. And then I try to exercise. My oncologist was huge on that. He would, he would say that every time, huge on that. And I have to admit during the pandemic, I slacked off a bit on that, and it's something I have to do better at, but I'm not gonna punish myself. I know what I have to do, I'm gonna get back and I'm gonna do it. Right. Right. Um, so exercise is a big part of the healing process and mitigate, mitigating problems um, down the road. Mm -hmm. And then um, mindfulness, you know, being present in the moment. And just, you know, first of all, telling yourself at this moment, I am safe. At this moment, I am safe. But then also learning how to breathe properly, um, relax, relax your mind, relax your body, it lowers blood pressure, lowers heart rate. And it's something that I've been doing more and more. I own a wellness center. So, you know, before COVID, we were doing it, you know, things live here. Um, we can do them virtually. My practitioners are doing virtual sessions, um, or my husband and I, we do it on our own. And um, it really, it really helps. Um, and I'll also admit, 
I, I'm seeing a psychologist because you need that objective viewpoint of validating how you're feeling and also though course correcting. If, you're, if your thoughts start to go in a, you know, not such a great place, helping to course correct that back. Right. And I feel like it's maintenance. And of course, during COVID, you know, everything is amplified because, you know, not only are you worried about the cancer issue, but, you know, your compromised immune system and what that, what the implications are of that. Right. So I have to be better and more careful than most. Right, right. It's, it's even more of a top of mind for you. Um, mm-hmm. Cheryl, I love all these things that you talked about, you know, because it's a very holistic approach. You talk about the physical health, um, the mental health, which by the way, I think we can't stress enough. Yes. It's such a sign of strength when people are mm-hmm. able to go, I think, and maintain mental health and well. Hey, I know I need help sometimes. Right. right. You know, and there are helpers. Right. There are people and your mental health is connected to your physical health, right. literally connected. Right. Um, and so you can't take care of one and not the, you, you're, you're, right. you're, you said whole, holistic, you know, we're, we're one body right. uh, with many different components right. that all have to be, we're not a part. We're not a, we're not a heart. We're not a, a spleen. We're not, um, we're not a lymphatic system. Right. We're the whole thing. Right, right. No, it's, it's, it's connected. It's, it's so true. Everything is connected. Um, now you, you mentioned something else um, in there. you you know, you've mentioned your husband throughout the story yeah. Yeah. and a uh, caregiving is, is mm-hmm. a huge part of this. Um, and we're lucky if we have people in our lives who are available to be caregivers, but could you talk about the support you needed the most, uh, through this journey? And, and also if you don't mind how cancer, um, you know, and the diagnosis and the treatment, the experience impacted your relationship. With your well, partner. Um, you, you definitely need support. Um, but I honestly didn't want too much support. And what I mean, I mean by that is I had a few of the people who were closest to me and I didn't want a lot of people coming to the hospital. I didn't want a lot of people visiting. Number one, it could have been an infection risk. Um, but number two, I just, I didn't want people seeing me like that, but more than that, I didn't have the strength and the stamina to entertain people. And then, oh, I got to get up and go to the bathroom and drag this pole in my, you know, nightgown or whatever. And now I have an audience in front of me, you know, I, so I only wanted, you know, very few of the close, the people closest to me around, but I knew, I knew there were lots of people pulling for me. Um, they were praying for me. They were sending me healing energy and, and, and light and goodness. I, I know they were. Um, I can't tell you how much that helps. And I ask for it every time when I'm going to my oncology visit. I ask for that again. Um, and it really gets me through, uh, through everything. So um, the support I needed was um, more logistical, like making sure I had what I needed. I had the food I needed. I, you know, could get to the cancer center. Um, My friend who's a retired doctor would help me with interpreting things and give me his advice on, on stuff. Um, I, I don't have much family. Uh, I, you know, um, I don't have any family in the, any, uh, within thousands of miles of where I live, except my husband. Um, and I, and I remember laying there in the bed in the hospital thinking, I wish I had a parent to be here and tell me everything was going to be okay. That's, that was hard. That was really hard. I, you know, everybody's dead. You know, I, I have no, you know, um, Nobody. And I, I just remember thinking that I wish I had a parent to um, hold me and tell me everything was going to be okay. Yeah. So that support I didn't have because they don't exist. <laughs> um, but I have a wonderful husband. Um, it was hard for him. It was very hard for him because he's not, um, he's not trained for this. 
but he loves me, I'm his world. And so whatever he could do, you know, he's in like IT, so he's that kind of brain. <laughs> um, but you know, whatever he could um, do for me, he would do, no question. Um, he would visit every day and he would bring my food. And, you know, however he could support me, he wanted to know, you know how can I help you? So, you know, thank goodness I, I had him and I had some really good close friends that um, helped. And I had, um, you know, the people operating my center while I was gone was able to keep my business open. So I was very fortunate for, um, for, for them and um, very grateful. Yep. And the classes still went on. Right. and um, things got done and so that was that was like a load off my mind like I guess people tried to take take whatever burdens off of me that they could in whatever way that they could right. and that's what a good caregiver uh, I think uh, does right. right they just they try to ease the the burdens right um, so much on your plate you know and like you said there was a flip that switched and you were in this mode, but there's really only so much bandwidth a human has. And so I'm really glad, um, Cheryl, that you had your husband and your close friends around you. Um, I have one last question for you. And you know, it's, yeah. it's one for new people who are uh, being diagnosed, who have just been diagnosed um, along with their caregivers, whether it's mantle cell lymphoma or, or something else, what, what's your message to them as someone who's already gone through this experience? Um, get your support team together. Like I said, get those few people in your circle that can help you, that can be there in whatever way you need them. Figure out who they are, whether they're family, friends, or professionals in some way in what they do. So get that support group. Don't read too much about your illness online. Don't do it. Only get the information that you need to know, but know enough that you're making the right decisions for you. And I'm not saying, you know, hide from it either, but you could get lost in what happened to this person and what happened to this person. And, you know, I would hear these stories from other people when I would be in the infusion room and there's like, you're next to people and they'd be telling you their stories about how, you know, this didn't work and then this and, and, and they got this from that. And, uh, you know, and it's like, I can't, I can't hear, you know, stay in your lane. You are an individual. You are a bio individual. No one else is like you. You will respond to the treatment in the way that you will respond, not the next person, not the person with the horror story. So you got to You can't, you can't go down that road. Uh, only, you know, positive, but at the same time, be educated and knowledgeable about what you're about to go through and make your own decisions. If something doesn't feel right, get another opinion. And if it still doesn't feel right, maybe you don't do that thing. You're not, you're, you're, you're not, uh, you're not forced to do anything. Actually, you have free will. If something really doesn't feel right, or maybe you don't connect with that doctor for whatever reason, you're the client, find another doctor. Sometimes the difference is the bedside manner it makes all the difference in the world. So um, the other thing is, in looking at statistics, mantle cell lymphoma has a really, really poor uh, survival rate, 10 year survival rate. And there's several reasons for that. 10% um, survive. 10 years. Okay, 10% That's somebody. Why can't that be you? It's going to be me. Somebody survives it. You be that. You be that 10%. You be that whatever percent it is, somebody makes it. Let that be you. I love that. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was so beautifully said. You've shared everything with us today. I hope we get to have you on again for more. We could dive into wellness topics and practices. Um, so Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us. I, re I really, really appreciate it. Sure, I, it was my pleasure. Um, 
anything I can do to help. I, I feel like I want to take what was a really, honestly, a horrific situation and turn it and make it into something good. Yeah. And if I can do that, then, you know, that's, that is what I'm going to do. Well, I love it. And I have no doubt that your voice is going to lift so many people who read and, and watch your story. So again, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Stephanie.